Today we're going to go over chapter one, review of basic mathematics. This will refresh you on uh, some very simple equations that you've learned in the past, whether it was in uh, grade school, uh, high school, uh, simple equations, addition, subtraction, working with fractions, and other uh, geometric uh, problems we'll be working on and uh, using geometry. Take the self-test odd number questions at the end of the chapter. These questions have the answers at the end of the chapter, and I require that you do every question. I also recommend that you uh, obtain a, uh, uh, some type of a calculator, whether it's a, one of the older models. Um, this is a foot-inch calculator, very handy in doing uh, some of the computations we're going to be doing in uh, feet and inches. And also has some conversions to, into decimals. So this would be very handy. Um, obviously, uh, there's uh, more uh, current type of um, equipment out there, whether it's an, an iPad or a smartphone. Um, you can get applications on these devices that will do conversions in feet and inches, gallons and ounces, and so forth. So um, they, they'll be very useful tools in your calculations. And they'll also um, make you more accurate in, in doing your calculations. So the mathematics we're going to be working on is something you will kind of use in your daily life right now, whether it's um, balancing your checkbook, or maybe you do uh, some small projects in your home, um, small construction projects or building projects that you may have worked on. And um, you know this will kind of brush you up on those. There'll be some math that will be more specific to our, uh, our class, and um, we'll be going over those um, in this chapter and in future chapters. Chapter 1, Review of Basic Mathematics. Chapter 1 is a very good chapter to brush up on basic math. Addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, fractions, decimals. Take, self, take the self-test odd-numbered questions at the end of the chapter, each of which has their answer. I also highly recommend getting a calculator that can convert feet and inches. You can usually obtain these free as an application for your electronic devices, smartphones, laptops, so forth. You can also buy foot-inch calculators inexpensively. These will give us uh, accurate solutions to our equations. The math we'll, you'll be going over is math you use on, usually on a day-to-day -day basis. So some of it's going to be refresher and some will be very common to what you've known recent in the recent past. Some math will be a little more specific to the HVAC technician in your career. Do not take the self-test questions 76 through 80. We will go over uh, questions like this separately and uh, review examples of our own. The object objectives of this chapter, chapter is to help technicians learn basic math. Determine what areas of math you need to improve by doing the self-test. Use equations to solve problems that are relevant to the HVAC profession. Calculations concerning areas of rooms, the volume of a space or room, areas of walls, whether the wall is made of brick or the different materials areas of windows and doors. These all will contribute to what is known as heat loss. You'll learn more about heat loss in another class. This chapter is more specific in just using equations to determine heat loss. Math problems will be rounded to a reasonable number, usually a whole number or the first decimal place. I prefer the first decimal place. This will give us accuracy and it's also the fewest number of digits we should probably have to deal with. The purpose of the chapter is for the successful technician to have a basic understanding of practical math. The chapter does not teach math, but test your math skills. So I'll go over some equations um, that pertain to the HV technician, but I'm really not going to teach you how to perform the equations. That is something you probably should have learned earlier in your education. And if, it, if you're a little weak in some areas, it's a good time to brush up or study further 
on some of the equations um, you need to master. If you need to get help from a classmate or another teacher or for tutoring, um, now's the time to maybe find that out. As I said, use the self-test sections to evaluate your skills in adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing numbers. This chapter will also be testing your skills as they relate to fractions, area, perimeter, and volume. You may not have used these equations since middle school or high school, so this is a good time to refresh your memory. You're going to ask yourself, why is this chapter important? Well, this is going to be a foundation um, that will help you in your career as an HVAC technician. Understanding basic mathematic principles will be an important component to being, to being successful. A few practical things that will apply to is calculating superheat and subcooling. Superheat is the amount of heat that the evaporator inside a unit picks up after the last of the liquid refrigerant is evaporated. Subcooling is the inverse. Both important to determine stability of a refrigeration system. You'll learn more about subheat, superheat and subcooling in other courses. But the mathematics you'll learn in this chapter will be applicable in determining superheat and subcooling. The chapter is also important, important for you to brush up on your mathematics that might be used to calculate uh, service tickets. A service ticket is a form that your company may have that will list or itemize materials used for a project, quantities of liquids, that type of thing that you'll have to add, subtract, multiply, divide, come up with, a, with an accurate um, summation of say materials or cost. Determine the area of a volume of a building or load calculations. Measuring installing ductwork and piping. You need to know how much of material you're going to need on a project. Quantifying those materials, adding them or subtracting them, is what this chapter is, little, is more concerned with. Practical use of HVAC math. We'll use figure one in the next slide as an example of how to apply these math skills. A load calculation can be developed from the information on this floor plan. Lo load calculations, as an example, require a certain amount of air conditioning equipment or heating equipment. And it's that equipment is sized based upon the size of a room or the amount of heat load or heat loss um, for that particular room. If the room is surrounded by glass, well the heat loss and heat gains are going to be different if, than if that room was surrounded by brick, with brick walls. Likewise, if the room is 50 square feet, it's going to have a different piece of equipment than if that room was 10,000 square feet. So the equipment may be smaller or larger, depending on the size of the room you're going to be using. Alright, let's refer to figure 1-1 here. Notice under the floor, under the words floor plan. Excuse me. I'd like to draw your attention to Figure One One. Right off, look at the lower left hand corner. You see the word floor plan. This is the title of the drawing. This should be listed on every drawing that you're uh, going to be working on or looking at. It helps you understand what drawing it is. So in this case it's a floor plan. Also underneath that word floor plan you see scale 1 8 inch equals 1 foot 0 inches. That's the scale of the drawing. For every 1 8th of an inch that you measure with your scale or ruler that equals to 1 foot in real world. The drawing has calculated the dimensions for you. What that means is there's dimensions up here for the overall length of the building, 49 foot 4, and the width of the building, 40 foot 8. Then there's other dimensions listed here uh, that actually looks like they locate columns that are inside the building. Here on this side, the, it appears that the, uh, there's these two dimensions locate the center or the center line of the building. Sometimes dimensions are not always listed on the print that you're working on. 
in that case you'll either need to uh, if it's important for an equation that you're working on working on um, contact the architect the building owner or in, in um, worst case scenario you might have to actually scale the drawings um, which is not recommended but if that's all that is available to you then that's what you will have to use All right, so what information do we need to learn from uh, figure 1-1? One one? First, the first equation we're going to look at is the area. The area can be calculated by multiplying the length and the width. Area equals length times width. Looking at figure 1-1, one one, the length of our building is 49 foot 4, the width 40 foot 8. Plug those two numbers in for the length and the width, multiply them, and you'll obtain your area of the building. The next equation, the perimeter. The perimeter can be determined by adding the length of each side. That will be perimeter equals side 1 plus side 2, 3, and 4, and so on. In this case, we have four sides to our building. We simply have to add them up. Side 1, 49 foot 4 side 2, 40 foot 8, side 3, it's identical to side 1, 49 foot 4, and side 4 is identical to side 2, 40 foot 8. Adding those numbers you can get the perimeter of your building. Let's do another calculation using a simple mathematic equation. This relates to figure 1.3. The diagram of a ceiling that is not flat. Let's take a look at that. The shaded areas, the blue areas, are not flat. They're sloped. The white area is flat. Let's take a look at a video to help explain exactly what we're looking at. One of the problems in the book refers to a cathedral ceiling, and I'll go into a little more detail about how to calculate the area for a cathedral ceiling, but I thought I should do a little sketch to help you visualize um, what it is we're talking about when we say uh, what is a cathedral ceiling. So uh, in the book, you'll see a, a, a drawing like this uh, with these tangled portions. This is actually what's called a reflected ceiling. So you're standing on the floor of a room or a space of any sort, and you're looking up. And this is what you're going to see in a flat plane. Now, to understand a little bit better what the ceiling looks like, I'm going to do another drawing. It's called a, a section, or building section. So we're actually standing right about here. We're going to cut a line through the room, through the ceiling, looking in that direction, so looking at the back of the room. So now, you'll, as you see, the sketch kind of helps you show what these angled lines mean. Well, actually, um, this is what's considered a cathedral ceiling. There's all types of cathedral ceilings, uh, but generally it means that there's a different plane or a different surface on the ceiling than just a flat plane. So here, these angled lines represent what's happening on the ceiling here and over here. All right, now that you have an understanding of what a cathedral ceiling uh, looks like in, in uh, a section, we're going to calculate the area of the cathedral ceiling. This would be the gross cathedral ceiling area. This is figure 1.3 on page 11 in your book. I read up here on uh, the information on the drawing. We're going to do the, uh, the scale we're going to use is 1 8 inch to 1 foot 0 inch not the quarter inch scale. And again, this I'm going to use the architect scale. We're going to uh, get into more detail using architect scale on another chapter. But just sort of follow along to see what I'm doing and uh, try to understand the calculation that we're going to be using to um, calculate the gross cathedral ceiling area. So first, let's begin by uh, using the scale, a scale, the 8-inch scale. And as you can see on my scale, uh, I'm going to isolate the eighth inch mark 
on there that tells me which scale I'm using on this, on this ruler. And I'm going to start measuring. First, I need, I, I want to understand the geometry here of this cathedral ceiling. And what I have are trapezoid shapes. These are the sloped parts of the ceiling. There's four of them. And then there's a rectangle, or possibly a square, uh, for the center part. So I need to, using my scale, determine the dimensions of these areas to calculate the overall gross area. So let's begin. I know that the area of a trapezoid, A equals H times L1 plus L2 divided by 2. A equals area. What is H? H is the height of the trapezoid. It's that dimension. So let's use the scale. And I'm going to determine roughly that is 3 feet 6 inches. Reading from 0, I know it's larger than 3 feet, so I'm going to go over halfway to the uh, gradient line of 6 inches and then read across. The next largest number is 4, which would be 4 feet. The next number, or gradient line over, is 3. So H equals 3 foot 6 inches. Now I have H. That's one part of the equation. What is L? Again, you can go back in your book in the uh, appendix, there are the formulas for geometric shapes, and you'll find trap the area for a trapezoid uh, in the appendix. It'll help you understand better uh, or refresh your memory what we're going through on this uh, problem. So L, L1 is the length of one side of the trapezoid. L2 is the length of the other side of the trapezoid. So it's the, the dimension from one corner to this corner and from this corner to this corner. So let's use our scale. Again, I'm going to line up zero at the corner and read across. Go from zero, using the smaller numbers now, ignore the upper numbers, that, re that refers to another scale on this ruler. So referring to the smaller numbers, I go 4, 8, 12, 16, then going 1, 2 over gives me 18 feet. So L1 equals 18 feet. Now let's measure L2. Starting at zero, reading across, again using, starting with the smallest numbers, 4, 8, 12, 24. The next increment over is one more foot, which is 25. Again, ignore 34. 34 pertains to another scale on this ruler. We're using the lower numbers here. So 24 plus 1 is 25. L2 equals 25 feet. Now we have the data that we can input into this formula. So A is area equals H, 3 foot 6 inches, times L1, 18, plus L2, 25, divided by 2. I'm going to use my foot inch calculator to do the equation. area of one trapezoid equals 75.25 square feet. We'll round this off to 75.3. Now I know I have four of them, right? One, two, three, four. Let's take a look at 
this trapezoid and see if it's a, a, the same dimensions as the first one. Starting with zero, reading over, 18. The bottom, 25. So this is a square with four identical trapezoids on it. So to get the overall area of just the trapezoids, I can multiply times four. Three hundred one point two. Now to complete the gross square footage of our cathedral ceiling, we have to understand the square footage of the flat plane, or the top of the ceiling. Let's calculate the center part of the ceiling to get our overall gross, gross cathedral ceiling area. We determined that the ceiling is a square. We've already determined that one side of the square is 18 feet. Since it's a square, I know this side is also 18 feet. The formula for area of a square is base times height. In this case, 18 times 18. Three hundred and twenty-four square feet. That's the square. Get the gross square footage. I'm going to add the trapezoids plus the square. Gives me a gross square footage of 625.2 square feet. And again, keep in mind we used the eighth inch scale to perform this calculation on this sketch. We'll get in greater detail using the scale on another chapter. So as you see from the video in that exercise, to determine the total area, calculate the area of the square as we did, the rectangle in the middle, and the area of the four trapezoids. And there's the uh, formula for the trapezoid area. Now using another example, let's follow along in this video in calculating the area and the perimeter of a, uh, of a building. Refer to drawing A-1. This was given to you in the uh, set of drawings that came with the book that you purchased. Alright, what I'd like to do now is um, calculate the area of our building. You all were given drawings as part of the book. And um, we're going to take one of those drawings out. It's drawing A-1. And uh, take a look at the, uh, the area of this floor and isolate just the information on the floor plan that we need to calculate this area. What I've also done is um, have a tracing of just the perimeter of the building. You see outlined in red, we have the exterior walls of the building. This will be important for our calculation. This is all we really need to know at this point to determine the area of our building. Um, in addition to the walls, we'll need to know the dimensions. Now, I know you can't see the dimensions uh, exactly on this drawing here in the video. That's why I ask you to refer to the drawing that was given to you while we go over this video. I'll, I'll isolate dimensions that are pertinent to this calculation. So we, we've isolated the perimeter of the building in red here. This will be the information that's pertinent to our calculation, that is the area of the building. Now I'm going to isolate the dimensions that are pertinent to our calculation. So let's begin. Top of the drawing, I need to know the overall length of the building. 
On your drawing, look closely. Take a look at your drawing. The overall dimension is 47 feet. Now, I need to know the dimension of this, what I call a bump out, or a cutout in the building. So the, the building is recessed in this area. So I'm going to isolate the, men, the dimensions of this recess. This dimension here, if you look closely, is four feet. I also want to know the length of that dimension. If you look closely on the drawing, the dimension is 16 feet. 16 foot, four inches. All right, let's work around to the other side of the building. Again, let's isolate the overall dimension. Closely, I see 50 feet. And then the cutout, what is that dimension? The depth of it, 3 feet 8 inches. And the overall length, 13 foot 4 inches. We have two sides of our building's dimensions. Let's take a look at the bottom here. We know the overall is the same. That lines up. Our cutout uh, is identical. It's four feet in depth and 16 foot four inches in length. So I'm not going to mark that down. We have those dimensions up here. We know it's identical. And then the other side of our building uh, is exactly the same as the right side of our building. 50 feet, and as you see, there's no cutout, so I don't need to add any more information to this side of the building. Okay, now that we've isolated the dimensions that we're going to be using in our calculation, let's perform some of the calculations. What I'd like to do, first off, is determine the gross square footage of this box that we're, that's shown here, and that's going to include these cutouts. And as you see, as we move along the equation, I'm going to remove these areas from our calculations. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to determine this gross square footage, 47 feet times 50 feet. So 50 times 47. It gives me 2,350 square feet. Now, this is not the area of our building, okay? We need to subtract these cutouts that are inside the building, or that recess into the building. So let's figure out what those areas are. All right, this first cutout of the building is uh, 4 feet uh, deep by 16 feet 4 inches long. So let's write that up here, 4 feet times 16 feet, 4 inches. Okay? Now refer to your drawing, and you'll see where I've got those dimensions from. All right, now this is important. Now we have our first calculation where we're using feet and inches. So using a, a calculator that calculates in feet and inches, I'm going to calculate 4 feet times 16 feet, 4 inches. And that gives me a square footage of 65.3 square feet. And in performing our calculations, we're going to uh, round off to the nearest tenth. Uh, it keeps the calculation simple enough, but still very accurate. So now we have uh, this overall square footage calculation. Now that includes these cutouts. Now we've calculated one area of the cutout, 65 foot point three square feet. And now we have another cutout that's a little different. Um, this is 3 foot 8 inch deep by 13 foot 4. Uh, well, let's back up a second. Referring to our drawing, I know that this cutout and that cutout are identical in dimension. So why don't we multiply 65.3 times 2, since we have two cutouts that are the same. So I'll multiply this number 65.3 times 2. And that gives us 130.6 square feet. 
Keep in mind, this is for this cutout and that cutout. Now let's calculate this cutout. Three foot eight times 13 foot four. That gives us Forty-eight point nine square feet. At this point, we have all the information. Now let's calculate the cutout uh, on the side of the building. We know it's different because of the dimensions. It's three foot eight inch deep by thirteen four inches uh, wide. Three foot eight inches times 13 foot 4. Again, look at your drawing carefully to find these numbers. Let's multiply those numbers. 3 foot 8 times 13 foot 4. And our, the area for this cutout is 48.9 square feet. So now we've calculated all the pertinent areas related to this building that we need to, that we, we will use to determine our gross square footage. That's everything inside this red line. There's other ways you can perform this calculation and you'll see there's other ways to do it. Um, this is just one example of how you go about doing this one. So the overall number was uh, 2,350 square feet. The numbers we need to subtract from that, we have three cutouts. Here's two of them. Here's the uh, third one. So I'm going to subtract this number and this number from this overall number. And that will give us our square footage. So 2350 square feet minus 130.6 square feet minus 48.9 square feet. Our gross interior square footage of this building is 2,170.5 square feet. Now you ask, why do we need this number? Well, in, an HVAC technician is going to need to know the gross area of the inside of a building to determine uh, heat loads and heat losses. And there's other calculations that we'll be using um, in this class and in future classes or other classes you may have taken already where uh, this will be one piece of the information that will go into that equation to determine heat loss. All right, now let's move on to another calculation that's going to be important um, for an HVAC technician, and that's the perimeter of our, of our bank building. Again, you're going to look at uh, drawing A-1, uh, same drawing that we looked at for the uh, square footage calculations. And we're going to isolate just the information we need to know to calculate the perimeter. Now the perimeter is going to be adding up all these wall segments going around the building, all the way around until we add up each one of them. So again, I use the. Um, I have some tracing paper here that I'm going to overlay on top of our drawing. Like I said before, I recommend doing this when you're performing calculations. That way, you can um, perform your calculations, mark up the drawing as you need to on tracing paper without affecting the drawing. Um, so you always have a clean copy of the drawing available. Okay, so let's begin. Again, let's isolate just the information that is pertinent to our calculation. And we're going to be determining the perimeter of our building, so we need to know the length of each wall segment. So here, this wall segment, and I know you can't see the dimensions on the video, so please refer to your drawing, and you'll be able to see them uh, much more clearly. All right, so this line segment is 15 feet 4 inches. We're just going to work our way all the way around the building. The next one, remember the cutout, that's four feet, zero inches. And the length of the cutout, if you remember, 16 foot 
four inches. All right, so we have this dimension, this one, this one. We know this is the same as that, so that's four feet. Now let's determine this dimension. Again, look carefully on your drawing, and you see it's already labeled for you, 15 feet, four inches. All right, let's continue around the side of the building. Next dimension, 18 feet, four inches. This cut out, three feet, eight inches. You know, this side and that side are identical, so I'm not gonna number that dimension. The length of our cutout, 13 feet, four inches. And this final segment here, 18 feet, four inches. I've isolated the dimensions on the top of the building, every wall segment, the side of the building, every wall segment. Now let's go to the bottom. Fifteen feet four. Sixteen four, fifteen four. So what do you see? You see some similarities to the top of the building. Um, they're identical. Now, if you want to write the dimensions down, you can go ahead, but um, you may not need to. The overall length of the last side of our building, you can look at our drawing, and you'll see that the uh, dimension is 50 feet, four inches. All right, now I have isolated every wall segment that I know a dimension for that will help us perform our perimeter calculation. So let's get started. Basically, we're just adding up all the wall segments. So let's begin adding the numbers. Fifteen foot four. Uh, next segment is four feet. Next segment, sixteen foot four. Another four foot segment. And another fifteen foot four segment. Using our foot inch calculator, let's add them up. Okay, the total length along this wall is 55 feet, zero inches. Let's continue now along the side of our building. 18 foot four, three foot eight, 13 foot four, Another three foot eight. And finally, 18 foot four. And the length of the, all these wall segments equals 57 foot, four inches. We'll call that lineal feet. That's lineal feet of wall, exterior wall in this case. Now we know that the top of the uh, bank building here, this, these wall segments are identical to these wall segments. So we can multiply the number we've calculated for the top by two. So that will give us these two lengths. We have this one. Our last segment is 50 feet. Oh, excuse me, it's 50 feet. Zero inches, not 50 foot four. So we have documented 
all the information we need to do our final calculation. So let's begin. I'm going to multiply this length, these wall segments, times two, because it's identical to these wall segments. So 55 times two, that gives me 110 lineal feet of wall that takes care of this part of the building. Now, this at this part of the building, I'm just gonna copy this number over, 57 feet, four inches. And then our final wall segment along here, 50 feet, zero inches. Let's add those up. Now I got four inches, seven, 2,274 lineal feet. Now that's the perimeter of our bank building. That includes every exterior wall segment completely around the building. So as you see from the video, the area of the drawing can be calculated by multiplying the length and the width. Now in this case we have uh, cutouts in the building that we subtracted from that gross area to determine our uh, net area inside the building walls. As you also saw, we calculated the perimeter, the length of each wall segment along the building. All right, let's take a look at another example. Uh, let's refer to drawing A-2. Again, this drawing was given to you with the purchase of your book. Uh, get that drawing out. Let's take a look at the rear elevation. That's the uh, drawing at the top of the page. We'll determine the gross wall area and the net wall area. Let's take a look at that video. All right, let's do another calculation um, that will be important to an HVAC technician. And this is gonna be calculating the net square footage of our exterior wall. And you're gonna ask yourself, why is this important? Well, an exterior wall is gonna react differently uh, in the winter and in the summer to uh, the sunlight or lack of sunlight. And the materials are gonna affect how much heat is gonna be lost from the inside of the building and how much heat is going to be gained from the outside of the building. So in our bank building here, um, let's refer to sheet A-2, get that drawing out um, as we talk about this. You'll see that we have, um, let's look, we're going to just use the rear elevation as an example. Uh, there's brick. The uh, indication on here tells me that this is a brick wall on this side of the building. There's brick on this side of the building. In the middle, there's glass, glass windows and glass doors. So the amount of sunlight getting in from the glass doors is gonna be significantly higher than the brick. The brick will have a higher insulation value than the glass, and therefore you'll need to know the square footages of these two different materials to help you determine uh, heat losses. And again, this is something you'll be uh, getting into more detail in another class. Our class is gonna be limited to uh, performing these simple calculations to help you expand and finish those other calculations. So let's begin. As I've done before, I have a little piece of tracing paper here. I can use to mark up. What I've done is outline the overall uh, rear of the building. Now, you're gonna have to refer back and forth between drawing A-1, which was our floor plan that had our dimensions on it, and to this drawing. And um, mark them up as, uh, as I show in the example. So I, I know from the floor plan that this overall dimension was 47 feet. So now I have the overall length here. Now I'm going to use a, uh, an architect scale. It's not important that you know how to use the scale right on this uh, example. We'll get into more detail on using the scale in a future chapter. But I know this drawing is drawn at a scale, and it says on the drawing, one quarter inch equals one foot. So I have an architect scale here. There's a uh, increment on here for one quarter inch scale drawings. So I'm gonna go ahead, what I, don't, what I need to determine is the height of the building, and, and particularly the height of this wall. I know this is roofing element here, but I'm not gonna include that in our calculations at this point. 
I'm going to just determine the square footage of the wall. So I don't, I don't have that number handy to me. And um, what I'm going to do is just use an architect scale to get a rough idea. So I put the scale up uh, at the bottom of the roof. I'm going to go down to the top of the sidewalk. And that dimension is 11 foot, 6 inches. Again, we'll get into greater detail on using the architect scale in another chapter. All right, so now I have the overall uh, dimensions of our wall. Let's isolate the width of the, um, the glass here. This is part of one of our cutouts. I know that dimension to be 16 feet, 4 inches. So with this basic information, I can now determine the net area of our wall, the amount of that it is brick, and the amount that is glass. So let's go ahead and do the calculation. Let's do the brick first. I have two pieces that are 11 foot 6. All right, let's go ahead and perform the calculation. First, I'm going to calculate the overall square footage of the entire wall. So that's a simple mathematic equation, right? 47 feet times 11 foot 6. That gives me 540 square feet. Point five square feet. Again, that's the entire area. Now let's just subtract out the glass so that you give us the exact square footage of the glass. I know the glass um, width is 16 foot 4 and the height is 11 foot 6. So let's multiply those two numbers. Again, use the footage calculator. This will make your life much easier and you'll have. Um, more accurate computations. One hundred seventy-eight point eight square feet. Glass. Now to figure out what the brick wall is, I just simply subtract one eighty-seven point eight from five hundred forty point five, and that'll give me the two brick areas. So 540.5 minus 187.8, 352.7 square feet. Right. Now we calculate the net square footage of brick and glass. And this is just for one side of our bank building on the rear elevation. So as you saw in the video, the formula to find the net wall area is we calculated for the brick. Um, net wall area of brick was the gross wall area. We measured the height of the building. We knew the length of the building. Got the gross area of that wall. And then we subtracted out the glass area, the windows and the doors. And what was left over was the area of the two pieces of brick wall on either side. So as you can see from the examples, that finding the net wall area is useful when doing heating or cooling load calculations. Doing a load calculation requires knowing the area of each major component. Area of walls, windows, doors, floors, and ceilings. Okay, let's take a look at a few uh, other practice problems here. Different shapes um, that are kind of exemplary of uh, shapes you might be running into as a HVAC technician. Practice problem number one. Find the volume of a room to determine required tonnage with airflow rate of 400 CFM per ton. 
the first thing we should do is isolate the formula that we're going to use. And again, all these formulas are in the appendix of your book. So determine the volume. Our formula is width times height times length. And those are labeled here. In this case, this is a, it's representing a room. The length of the room is uh, 50 feet. The height is 8 feet tall. And the width is 20 feet. Simply plug those numbers in to the equation. 20 times 8 times 50. And our solution is 8,000 cubic feet. Now we were told that there is an airflow rate of 400 CFM per ton. So we divide 400 CFM into 8,000 cubic feet. We get our answer, 20 tons of air required. And we get our answer, 20 tons of air required. All right, let's take a look at another practice problem. The tech needs to convert a round duct to a square duct. Say you have a customer who needs to replace some ductwork in a building, and instead of using round duct, they would prefer square duct. Um, perhaps the uh, size of the space changed, uh, or there's some other limitations to the project where round duct is no longer required. So we're going to switch those out. So first we have to determine the area of this round duct. The duct overall diameter is 12 inches. That's from one edge of the circle to the other edge of the circle, the duct in this case. If you refer to your appendix, you'll see that the area of a circle is pi r squared. Pi is a Greek symbol. And pi is a uh, mathematical symbol for the ratio of the circumference to its diameter. And it always is 3.14. R is the radius. Well, we know that diameter is 12, and the radius is half of that. So our radius is 6. So let's plug in those numbers to our equation. 3.14 times the radius times the radius, 6 times 6, is 113 square inches. So we know the area of the square duct needs to be 113 square inches. I know from experience that a 6 inch by 19 inch duct would be a close match. For our purposes today, I'm more concerned with you understanding the area, get, solving the equation for the area of a circle, or in this case a duct, um, learning more about an equivalent square duct will take place in another course. Let's look at our last problem now. The tech needs to add chemicals to a chilled water tank that is 6 foot in diameter and 12 foot tall. Calculate the capacity of the tank. Alright, let's take a look at our given information again. The water tank is 6 foot in diameter. Okay, The diameter is from one edge of the circle to the other. Half of that is the radius. So in this case, 6 feet diameter, half of that is 3 feet, so our radius is 3. The height of our tank is 12 feet. Let's simply substitute our numbers into the equation. Pi times radius times radius times height gives us a volume of 339 cubic feet. Now here we're told that there is, there is 1.34 cubic feet per gallon using a uh, calculator or converter. You can find that conversion of cubic feet to gallons, but here it's listed. So we simply divide 300 cubic feet, that's this volume of our cylinder, by cubic feet per gallon, which is 0.134. And we can determine that the quantity of, of gallons that can be held in this tank is 2,529.85. We're going to round that off to 2,529.9 gallons.